think when we're talking about climate change, a future in which we know there will be more climate instability and unpredictability, the word that feels the most resonant to me is the word resilient. That that should be paramount. That we need to look at, we need to look at ecological resilience, we need to look at economic resilience. And connected to these, we need to look at cultural resilience. And I'm going to talk about what I mean by this for a moment. So to talk about what I mean by an ecologically resilient farm, I want to take you to the driftless region of Wisconsin. So I went to the driftless region of Wisconsin in 2008. And that summer, if you remember, the Midwest was hit with some of the worst floods that the region had ever experienced. It caused uh, uh, $15 billion in damages. Several dozen people were killed in those floods. And the farmers throughout most of the Midwest were, were really devastated. So I went to go visit this farmer. I was doing research for the book, and I had set up these interviews long in advance of this flood ever happening. And so there I am going to visit this farmer, and I'm feeling like a jerk. Like, here I am going to try to bother this farmer to let him, let him interview me for my book when he's probably feeling the most devastated he's ever felt. And maybe his farm isn't even going to make it, because that's what I'm hearing in the news about how much the farmers have been impacted. So I'm driving out to his farm. It's called New Forest Farm. I'm going out to meet Mark Shepard. And I'm driving there, and I'm passing by what I know is farmland, but it looks like lakes because the water is just sitting on top of this flat, flat farmland. And I get to Mark's farm, and it was this very cinematic moment, actually. So I pull up, and he's sort of the, he, I, I pull up this long gravel road up to the crest of this hill where he told me to meet him. And right as I pull up, the clouds part in the sky, and the sun sort of starts beaming down right onto Mark Shepard and his farm apprentice, who are relaxing on the sun porch of his apple cider mill that he's just finished building, uh, that is going to be powered by solar panels and by uh, a wind turbine that he's putting up in his backyard. And he doesn't look like he's too devastated. So I pull up and I, you know, one of the first questions I ask is, Mark, are you doing okay? How's your farm? How did you fare? And what he says is he proceeds to explain to me why his farm is resilient and why despite this being one of the worst floods in the region's history, his farm, actually a lot of the crops growing on his farm have never been better, he said. And I'm standing there interviewing him, talking to him about his farm. He's telling me all this while literally we can see the rows of commodity monoculture chemical corn fields all around him. Rows of corn fields that his farm was just 13 years before he took it over and transformed it. And we can see as he's talking the gullies that have been dug out of those farm fields by the rain that has just hit the region. And there we are, standing on his farm, and it was just absolutely like Eden. I mean, he had more, there was this one, one area alone where we were standing in front of and we were you know, talking about whatever we were talking about, his multi-cropping permaculture system. And offhandedly, he's like, oh yeah, I've got about 86 different varieties of foods growing right there. And what he proceeded to explain to me is what farmers have known for millennia, which is there is resilience and safety in diversity. That the worst thing we can do, the least resilient thing we can do, is create monocultures, where we are entirely dependent on one crop. The worst thing we can do is create a system that's entirely dependent on fossil fuels for your soil fertility and for your pest resistance and for your weed resistance. And the best thing that we can do is to promote biodiversity on the farm, as he does. And like I said, he did it with bringing together not just different annuals, but other perennials, and there was trees, and there were bushes, and there were, there were foods growing at like all different levels and stages of life, and that things that were ripe at different times, and he would pick at different times in the year. And his business model was also a resilient one, in that he was building that cider mill because he knew that out of an apple uh, orchard, out of, his ap out of the apples that he would pick on his land, only a small percentage would actually be the right size and the shape to sell as apples. And a typical apple grower would just lose the rest of that crop and just plow it under. 
and would lose all the money that went and all the energy that went into growing those apples. And so what he's doing is he's, yes, yeah, selling those apples that look like the kind of apple you and I might want to eat, and then making his own apple cider with those that aren't able to sell in that way. So he's able to essentially get 100% of the value from his apple crop. And that's just one example of one crop. And as I said, we're standing there, and I'll just list some of the things that he had growing at this one point on his field. He had bush cherries and Siberian peas and apricots and cherries and olives and mulberries, blueberries, rose hips, asparagus, hickory nuts, oak, apples, chestnuts. You get the idea. And he explained to me fundamentally about when you have this kind of uh, agroecological farm where you're really tapping into natural cycles and natural forms of soil fertility, where you're really focusing on building healthy soil, what happens is the soil acts more like a sponge when the rain comes versus those fields across the way where the soil has been ignored, where all the soil microorganisms have literally been killed off. And everything has been, all that soil fertility and all the things that plants need to grow have been synthetic, have been put in, have been input, have been inputs that have had to be bought by the farmer. And so his, his soil was able to absorb the rain that came. He also did really basic things, like he built these uh, swales, they're called. And if you can picture like a, the, a, a herringbone pattern, those are what swales are, where they sort of, he cut into his farm these ditches that actually was able to then, when the rain came, he was controlling where that rain went. And he was able to actually then capture that rain to grow to intentionally and use it. And he, as he said, some of his crops had never been better. And so it's farms like Mark Shepard's New Forest Farm that I think of when I think of resilient farming. Uh, we, we also know, as I, I mentioned about this resilient agroecological farming, that it means incredibly decreasing the amount of emissions associated with our food because you're not using all that synthetic fertilizer and all that, those chemicals. There are studies out of the Rodale Institute that's finding that these well-managed soils can also be a way to store more carbon in the soil so that people are actually looking at how agriculture might be a way to mitigate, the clim mitigate some of the climate crisis to be able to pull some of that carbon dioxide and store it in the soils. So ecological resilience, I think, is key. The second thing I talked about was this idea of economic resilience, economic resilience. In 2007, so the year before I was at Mark Shepard's farm, going into 2008, you probably will be, remember, that, that those were the years where we were, the entire planet was hit by the food price crisis, right? Where prices just skyrocketed for many people's most basic, basic food items. Rice went through the roof, corn through the roof. A lot of what we heard is that, oh, that, you know, part of the reason or main reason why that food crisis happened is because of climate change. There was that serious drought in Australia, and the wheat harvest in Australia was devastated. So we hear the climate crisis is making us you know, more, more, more vulnerable because of droughts that are going to impact our, our abundance or impact yields. But actually, that was only one part of the story. And I would argue, actually, a pretty small part of the story. The bigger part of the story about why were so many countries so vulnerable to those fruit, food price spikes has to do with the story of economic resilience. and has to do with a story, you have to sort of go back in history a bit and look at how for, for many decades now, developing countries all around the world were required to dismantle their systems for creating food reserves, for creating the reserves that would have provided some buffer for when something like uh, you know, a, a shortfall in yields happened. And so they were required to dismantle those reserves as part of International Monetary Fund and World Bank structural adjustment programs. So yes, developing country, we will give you a loan, but on the following conditions. One of those conditions being you have to open up your markets for imports and you have to stop protecting your farmers through things like food reserves. And, and propping up local farmers and, and local food. And so what's happened globally and, uh, is this lack of food self-sufficiency and food resilience that then when something like what happened in 2007 and 2008 happens, people are so vulnerable that instead of being able to handle something like that, they go hungry. <laughs>